Welcome back to the class on international business communication. Uh, we were talking about interpersonal communication last time. So let's get back to discussing that again. Um, let's revise as usual. I would like you to reflect on your own experiences as a newcomer in a professional situation. Uh, discuss amongst yourselves what happened when you joined a new place. How did you learn your way around? What did you do? Who did you talk to? Who did you ask for information? Who did you make friends with? Who did you feel uncomfortable around? Who did you perceive as your superior? Did you perceive your organization as a vertical or a horizontal organization? Did you feel comfortable talking to your seniors? Why, why not? All of those things. So please discuss amongst yourselves. It is very, very relevant. And do think about the kinds of verbal and non-verbal signals coming to you from your environments that contributed to your feeling a certain way. Okay. Uh, I also want you to discuss which of the socialization techniques did your superiors use to induct you into the organization? Were you part of a group? Did you have to go through the uh, same thing? Did you know 50, 100 of you have to go through the same thing together? Did you have icebreaker sessions? What did you do? Or were you inducted individually into the organization? So, uh, and why? Which socialization technique did you feel most comfortable with and why? Where did you feel uh, uh, absolutely under the gun? Where did you feel that somebody was constantly watching you? Where did you feel that uh, you could have done better after the experience had ended? Where did you feel you did a great job? Where did you feel you could actually, where did you feel you had actually started becoming comfortable in this new environment? At what point did you realize that you were a part of this new situation that you found yourself in? And by professional situation, I mean, it could be your job, it could be uh, your entry into the business college or business school, whatever you're in. It could be your internship, it could be a, uh, uh, prof any other professional scenario that you found yourself in. Uh, slightly long term, of course, it doesn't really relate to a meeting, but maybe, you know, um, some sort of a social event or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I had also asked you to think about gossip. And uh, gossip, according to Hafen, again, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right, um, is healing talk that connects intimately to one another, healing talk, which means it has a positive connotation. We normally use the word gossip in a negative context, but here we are calling it healing talk, something that we feel comfortable with, something that helps us heal emotionally, that connects intimately to one another in communication based on community. So, it is some sort of conversation that happens within a community, within a group of people that share common interests, common uh, experiences, maybe some common goals, maybe some common uh, uh, things that they want to move towards, maybe some form of uh, communal, not communal, sorry, community feeling, some sort of feeling that connects them formally and informally to each other. Uh, skill building talk, it could also be talk centered around some sort of uh, formation of some sort of skill as we compare our behaviors to others, we get feedback, we talk to each other informally, we realize what is positively construed or perceived in our environments, what uh, others perceive positively about us and what they don't perceive positively about us, what people think, uh, where people think we are going wrong, where people think we are going right. I mean, most of us may say, oh, I'm not affected by what people say about me. In reality, that is not true. We don't think like that. We are all affected by what people say about us in our environment, especially in professional settings, we are all affected by what our peers, by what our superiors think of the way we uh, uh, do our work, of the uh, effects of what we do, uh, of the uh, manner in which our uh, efforts produce results. We are all uh, impacted by it, we are all affected by it, we are all concerned about what people think. 
nobody wants to be disliked at his or her workplace. Uh, we want our colleagues to say nice things about us. If there is an award for good service, we all want to get that award. If there is a promotion based on our work, we all want to get it. We'll say, oh yeah, well, I will uh, get my promotion based on my work. I don't have to say anything about it. I don't care what people feel. In reality, we are concerned because when I get a promotion, my peers feel that I have really been doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so even if I don't brag about it, if I get promoted to a higher level, people notice. And uh, however subtly it affects me, the way people think about my work does affect me. Okay, so that is gossip, skill building talk. And if it affects me, eh, the feedback I get from my environment in turn affects uh, or helps me to... Uh, the, the feedback I get from my environment in turn uh, helps me to refine my skills in a manner that is more acceptable to my superiors, in a manner that is more uh, acceptable to my peers, in a manner that is more uh, uh, positively perceived by my professional environment, in a manner that uh, this perception positively rewards me or positively reinforces me in some manner or the other. So that is why we call it skill building talk. 10 people are saying, you know, so and so hasn't been doing this right. Ha 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 ha. I hear about it and I'm like, okay, if 10 people are, even if two people are saying it, I don't like it. Why have I given them a reason to say something negative about me? Or if I hear about people talking uh, positively behind my back, which is of course rare, um, in that situation, uh, I start feeling uh, that yes, I'm doing something right. So I have a, t I will have a tendency to repeat the behaviors that I get positive informal feedback on. I hope you all agree with me. Just again, you know, this whole course is not about giving you formulae. It's not about giving you patches. It's not about giving you um, uh, to the point, uh, you know, strategies for going about things. I just want you to start thinking about these things. I want you to start thinking about the positive effects of gossip. It does have a positive impact on your lives. Okay. Um, skill building talk and disempowering talk. Empowering or disempowering talk as we compare our behaviors to others. Uh, sorry, uh, empowering or disempowering talk that evokes feelings of dominance for gossiper and subordination for gossipy, which means if I am the one saying something and somebody else is nodding their heads, yes, yes, they are agreeing to whatever I am saying, it empowers me. I get positive feedback and I feel that I am playing the dominant role in the conversation. I have more information to share as the gossiper and the gossipy, because whatever I'm saying is so interesting, it has so much of spice and masala in it, that um, the gossipy, the person who's listening to this gossip is slightly at a lower level. We were talking about the levels that we negotiate in our communication. So the person who is being, uh, who's hearing all this gossip has lesser, is craving that information that I'm sharing informally by way of gossip. And uh, so this empowers the gossiper. I feel more powerful. I feel more in control. And it disempowers the person who doesn't have so much of interesting information to share. Okay. And that is what gossip does. This is something I wanted you to think about. Please think about these things. They, everything has two sides to it. Even something that is perceived to be completely negative like gossip and to be avoided at all costs has its benefits. I also want you to think about, again, this is a related question connected to what I just said. I want you to discuss what the role of gossip is in the formation of formal and informal interpersonal relationships at work. How does gossip influence what we talk about? who we connect with, who we become friends with, who we get scared by, who we are intimidated by, intimidated by, who we tend to avoid, who we tend to hang out with, all of those things. Okay. Uh, and of course, before we begin, I have another interesting clip 
from the movie The Queen. Uh, I may end up showing the whole movie to you. I am trying not to, but there are very interesting clips from this movie that um, I uh, think make a lot of sense in the context of whatever we have discussed so far. So, this is a short clip. So, let us just get to it. Uh, all right, uh, before we get into this, please look up uh, details about the movie The Queen. Um, it is a fictional account of uh, Tony Blair's relationship with the royal family around the time of Princess Diana's death. So, that is what this movie is all about and uh, um, there are clips in this that I think are very, very relevant to this course. Okay. Landslide. Oh, oh I see. They've stopped the traffic completely for Tony Blair's first day of power in London. You've got the ceremonial, the tourists, the official, and you've got a lovely summer's day. And for Tony Blair to waving to the crowds, people waving to them there. I guess most of them do know it's the, the Prime Minister waiting in line in the streets there. The Prime Minister's on his way. <coughs> to be, Robinson. Prime Minister to be. I haven't asked him yet. It's a hard one to read, isn't it? Yes. On the one hand, his background is quite establishment. Father a conservative, educated at fetters, where he was tutored by the same man as the Prince of Wales. Well, we'll try not to hold that against him. On the other, his manifesto promises the most radical modernisation and shake-up of the Constitution in 300 years. Oh, you think he's going to try and modernise us? Well, I wouldn't put it past him. He's married to a woman with known anti-monarchist sympathies. You may remember her curtsy the first time you met. It could best be described as shallow. <laughs> I don't measure the depth of a curtsy, Robin. I leave that to my sister. But the atmosphere in Downing Street is expected to be very informal. Everyone on first name terms at the Prime Minister's insistence. What, as in call me Tony? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I don't like that. Have we sent him a protocol sheet? <laughs> I met you often enough before. I know, but never one to one. I'm never as Prime Minister. Well, just remember, your man's just been elected by the whole nation. But she's still, you know, the Queen. When we reach the audience room, I will not. We will not wait to be called, we shall go straight inside. Standing by the door, we bow from the neck. I will introduce you, the Queen will extend her hand, you go to her, bow again, then shake her hand. A couple of other things. It's ma'am as in ham, not ma'am as in farm. And when you're in the presence, at no point must you show your back. The presence? Yes, sir. That's what it's called when you're in Her Majesty's company. Would you like to sit there, Mrs. Blair? Congratulations. Children must be very proud. I hope so. You have three, haven't you? That's right. Oh, how lovely. Such a blessing, children. Uh, please, do sit down. Thank you. Have we shown you how to start a nuclear war yet? Uh, no. No, oh, first thing we do, apparently. Then we take away your passport and spend the rest of the time sending you around the world. <laughs> you obviously know my job better than I do. Yes, well, you are my tenth Prime Minister, Mr Blair. My first, of course, was Winston Churchill. He sat in your chair in frock coat and top hat. 
He was kind enough to give a shy young girl like me quite an education. I can imagine. With time, one has hopefully added experience to that education and a little wisdom better enabling us to execute our constitutional responsibility. To advise, guide, and warn the government of the day. Advice which I look forward to receiving. Yes, well, we'll save that for our weekly meetings. If there's nothing else, I believe we have some business to attend to. Of course. Your Majesty, my party has won the election, and so I come now to ask your permission to form a government. No, Mr Blair. Mr Blair, I ask the question. The duty falls upon me as your sovereign to invite you to become Prime Minister and to form a government in my name. And if you agree, the custom is to say yes. Yes. Lovely to see you again. And congratulations. You must be very proud. Yes. And exhausted, I imagine. Where will you be spending the summer? Oh, France. Oh, lovely. You'll be in Balmoral, I think. Yes, yes, I can't wait. It's a wonderful place. You know, my great-great-grandmother Victoria said of it, in Balmoral all seems to breathe freedom and peace and make one forget the world and its sad turmoils. Oh, oh excuse me. I'm so sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. Not too short, was it? 15 minutes? One doesn't want to be rude. No. Okay. Um, that was a clip on um, socialization. It was an interesting example of how individual socialization can take place. And before we move on, I want you to start thinking about how uh, individual socialization can impact the organization in addition to impacting the employee. Everything has two sides. What we are put through in an organization will impact uh, us as employees. The manner in which we respond to this new organization as new employees will impact the organization as well. So uh, let's move on. Again, unless otherwise specified, the source for the slides in this presentation is this article uh, by Myers, Seabold and Park. Uh, <clears throat> the tight article is titled Interpersonal Communication in the Workplace and it appears in um, ML Knapp and J.A. Daly's book called The Sage Handbook of Interpersonal Communication, 4th edition. Uh, so, um, if you are interested, I suggest that you order one copy for your library. I am not trying to advertise the book. I have no links with Sage publications. I just think that it is a valuable resource to have if you are interested in um, a good uh, collection of uh, uh, well-reviewed articles and, uh, and conceptual papers on communication, interpersonal communication per se. Okay, we had talked about the areas where interpersonal communication becomes important for study in organizations. Uh, we discussed organizational assimilation and socialization. We discussed, uh, we were discussing uh, the, the assimilation and socialization process. Uh, and along with this, we are we were also uh, relating supervisor subordinate communication and emotion management and power and control to organizational socialization. Within organizational socialization, we had discussed the processes of becoming familiar and working with supervisors. We talked about becoming acquainted with co-workers. We also talked about acculturating. We have four more topics to cover within this lecture. So let's move on. Being recognized. Being recognized specifically refers to uh, the uh, acceptability 
uh, of our work, of us as people, of, our, of us as employees and co-workers in the organization. It, uh, it is essentially uh, the perception people have about us as valuable employees, as comfortable co-workers, as, uh, as good superiors, as effective, obedient subordinates by people around us. And uh, it is also the, the feeling that we have um, about our contribution, our perceptions regarding our contribution to the organization. How effective am I? How well do I fit in? Do I fit in at all? So that is my self-efficacy. I, uh, I feel, um, you know, I, I have some perception, some idea of how well I fit into the organization and that's, that is what being recognized is. Some manners in which employees may be recognized in an organization are informal recognition, uh, which is uh, something that happens in and through our communication with people. You see your co-workers, they seem happy to see you. They seem to be coming to you with uh, requests for informal requests for feedback, with informal requests for um, information, with informal requests for support. So that is informal recognition. The other manner in which we can feel recognized in an organization is positive feedback credibility of supervisor, it depends on the credibility of the supervisor. Um, our uh, feedback, you know, depending on the credibility of the supervisor, how we perceive, how important we perceive the supervisor is, we or how influential we feel the supervisor is or how uh, trustworthy we feel our supervisor's word is, um, has a bearing on how we perceive the supervisor's feedback. And that in turn uh, impacts how recognized we feel in an organization. If I uh, have a superior who is very influential and again Pell's effect comes in here. If I feel that my superior uh, has something worthy to say, is well uh, respected in his or her area of expertise, um, I am uh, more likely to take this person's uh, feedback, positive or negative, as, as contributing to my feeling of self-efficacy. Oh, so-and-so is saying it, so-and-so is well recognized, so whatever he or she says must mean something. Feedback by co-workers, again, uh, depending on what I feel about my co-workers, positive feedback coming from my co-workers has a tendency to uh, add to my feeling of self-efficacy. Uh, emergent leadership, again this is not somebody, leadership, uh, it's not formal leadership, it is the perception of somebody emerging as a leader, somebody emerging as the, as the, the uh, risk taker, somebody emerging as the pioneer in new ideas, new kinds of work uh, by the co-workers. When we get together in a group or a team, um, sometimes people are designated to lead the group and at other times people are, are uh, just left on their own. Okay, you're a team, please get this work done. And one person uh, um, ultimately ends up taking the lead and pushing others and so all those things. So that is emergent leadership and uh, we'll cover more about this in leadership communication but all this happens in and through communication you'll say okay you're bringing organizational behavior into communication you are talking about uh, human resources in communication that's what communication is all about communication is not about concept by concept detail communication is all about applying whatever we know to our situations when we, it is applicable to leadership, it is applicable to feedback, it is applicable to human resources, it is applicable to any kind of technical discipline. You may be the expert in your field but unless you are able to share that information, share that emotion, share that passion with others, you can't get things done. So leadership depends on communication and it evolves through communication. So that's why all this is mentioned here. Okay, becoming involved is another stage. Once we feel recognized, the next stage we move um, on to in the socialization process is becoming involved. 
and uh, workers who are involved with the organization seek ways to contribute in the workplace, often by volunteering to perform extra work or uh, take on added responsibility for the sake of organization and its members. If I feel connected to the organization, if I feel like a part of the organization, I will start taking more and more initiative. I will start doing more than what I am expected to do. I will start going that extra mile. And uh, because I see myself as an integral part of the organization, I see myself as a, somebody who is contributing uh, in a very valuable manner to the organization. I see my work making a difference to the overall work of the organization. And when I see that, I perceive that, I feel that I am one person who the organization cannot do without. You know, when we start getting that feeling, it may or may not be true. Nobody is irreplaceable, nobody is indispensable. Everybody can be replaced and, and dispensed with and people do substitute and they, many people end up doing better jobs than the original employees. What I am trying to say is that as an employee of an organization, my feeling of being an integral part of the organization has a bearing on how well I do my work. It has a bearing on how I communicate with others. And how does communication come into this whole picture? I get signals. I get signals from my environment. I get signals from people and I send out signals. I send out signals regarding my passion for my work. I don't only say that I'm involved. I show it through my verbal and non-verbal uh, behaviors as to how involved I am about my work, uh, in my work and how much I care about my organization. So that is what becoming involved is and this cannot happen unless we have socialized with our superiors. We know exactly where we stand in relation to our seniors. We have become acquainted with our co-workers. We have uh, imbibed the culture of the organization that we are in. So we are acculturated and we have started feeling recognized. And now I'm giving you a revision of the past stages. It's important. Okay. <clears throat> Factors affecting involvement of employees with their work. The first one is social information processing, which is talk amongst employees. You know, we professors have a habit of attaching very complicated labels to very simple things. And again, uh, I'm in the same boat. Uh, as we study something more and more, go deeper into concepts, we, we start defining these concepts so well that we come up with these very complicated terms. But again, I know the people listening to this lecture are not really concerned about these terms. They, are, uh, they may be concerned. I hope you're concerned about the applicability of these very difficult concepts to your daily lives as business professionals. So social information processing is nothing, refers to in very simple terms, refers to the talk amongst employees. How do they take this information that is uh, exchanged in social uh, situations and how do they interpret it, how do they process it and how do they pass it on. It can make a chain reaction, it may start a chain reaction either way. You are, uh, a group of people perceives the organization as very, very ethical. A group of people perceives the organization as par excellence. That is what happens in IITs. We are a regular organization like all others. The only difference between us and the other organizations is one, we take people who are very committed, who are very hardworking and who have demonstrated a level of excellence uh, throughout their academic and professional careers. And I hope I'm not, you know, put on the line for this, but that has been my experience. That that is one major difference between IITs and other colleges. It's not that the other colleges don't focus on excellence. We insist on excellence. We don't give our students or uh, staff or faculty a choice. Uh, so that is one thing. But uh, again, that word spreads. So it's social information processing. Somebody talks about IIT and as a part of IIT, when I hear all this going on around me, 
you know, I hear my colleagues taking initiative, I hear about my colleagues doing new things, I hear about my colleagues winning national and international awards, I hear about my colleagues publishing papers in high impact international peer reviewed journals uh, and, and I hear this continuously and I feel that as a part of IIT, I am required to do all this. I am I'm actually required, I uh, actually have to do all this to remain a part of IIT and that is true. Uh, similarly, so all these positive signals are coming to me, you know, uh, this is something that will take me up in my profession and uh, it is good to publish papers in new journals, it is good to take risks and develop new technologies, it is good. To, uh, to do new things. It is uh, good to be strict with students when it comes to academic integrity. It is good to insist on excellence by my students. It is good to challenge my students. So, I hear all these positive things coming from my environment and, and uh, people talk about it and that starts a chain reaction and that reinforces the beliefs I had about IIT, the beliefs I had about uh, a center of excellence and I start sort of putting much more into it. So, you know, I feel okay, somebody else thinks like me and it is not only somebody else, it is these, you know, uh, it is the entire community thinks like this. So, yes, I am a part of this community. On the other hand, a negative reaction may also start, something wrong happens, something bad happens and um, people start feeling uncomfortable about their environment and they feel that their organization is not very ethical, their organization is people in their organization are not very ethical, they, they are continuously doing wrong things or uh, people are not uh, giving the organization their best. Uh, most people come to the office and uh, uh, sit around and you know if the office begins at 10 o'clock, they arrive at 11 o'clock, they sit around, have a cup of tea, uh, you know, sign some papers and leave and uh, uh, the others start feeling uncomfortable about this. So, uh, they start talking about it, they share this information, uh, they may have seen one person and you know two people seeing two different people or five people seeing five different people get together and say, you know what, I have also seen something similar happening and then person B says, I have also seen something similar happening. Person C says, yes, I have also seen something similar happening. So, A, B and C are, uh, are talking about this and suddenly person D and E walk by and they feel, oh my God, these three people have already seen something. So, even if we have not seen a similar thing, we will start believing in it. Not only will we start believing in it, we will start actively looking for such negative things in our environment. And the minute we spot one, there is a person D who comes up with a similar experience. And so, another two people walk by and that starts a chain reaction. You know, these four or five people have seen negative things happening. So, the whole uh, community is, is bad or the whole environment is bad and we start talking about these things and uh, again that may affect the involvement of employees who have not really witnessed or experienced these negative things themselves. But just our conversation about things that we may have witnessed, negative things that we may have witnessed is likely to deter them from putting in their best, is likely to um, increase the feeling of insecurity in them, is likely to, to stimulate them to look for other options elsewhere. Okay. The challenge of various activities is another factor affecting involvement with, of employees with their work. Uh, we are all uh, busy professionals, we are all uh, committed to our work. We all want to grow in our work and one way of growing in our work is to seek out challenges and overcome those challenges and then look back and say, you know what, I was able to do this. So, uh, the more challenges we get, the more involved we get in our work, perceived challenges. Again, it is all about perception. Something may be actually difficult for us, but it is made even more difficult by the way people talk about it and they say, you know what, it is so difficult to get published in Harvard Business Review. Uh, my understanding is that if I have done, uh, if I have carried out a piece of research that is relevant to the business environment and I have done it honestly and sincerely and I have followed 
um, whatever uh, I, you know, I have done my uh, uh, thorough research of uh, uh, re a thorough review of literature. I have uh, uh, gone through the all all the possible uh, options of. Uh, exploring um, all the possible methodology, all the possible methods and come up with a method that suits my work best and I have drafted my paper well and I am not going to go into a discussion on research writing here. All I am trying to say is that if my work has been good, uh, if I have done it sincerely, if it is relevant and if it is presented in a manner that is in line with what Harvard Business Review is looking for, then yes, my paper has an equal chance of getting published. Why would they not publish it? If it is a new idea and if I have proven that whatever I am saying is going to be relevant to the business environment and to research and researchers in business, then there is no chance that it will be rejected. But there is this big monster sitting on our heads. The same thing with our class 10 examinations, big hawa, I am sorry, monster, big devil. Uh, same thing with the civil services examinations, yes, they are looking for specific things. Yes, we have to work very, very hard to clear the civil services examinations. Similarly, for the JE examination, similarly for the for any kind of uh, position, it's very difficult to get a promotion in this line. Why? So it is made even more difficult by the discussion. Somebody says, you know what? I appeared for the civil services four times and I failed every time. I got to the mains and I couldn't clear the mains the first two times and I got to the interview and I could not clear the interview. It's very difficult. I topped throughout my school and college but I couldn't get past this. So it is, you know, there's this big thing around every situation that makes it more difficult. And again, if it is challenging enough, then it gets us involved. If it is more challenging than we expect it to be, then it removes us from the the, the level of involvement slowly starts diminishing. So, it's the curve goes like this. It increases up to a point and then it starts coming down if the challenge increases beyond a point. And it's not the challenge, it is the perception of the challenge. Organizational expectations communicated formally or informally. Going back to the example that I was sharing with you, what does my organization expect from me? They want me to get published. They would like me to, to create new knowledge and share it with people who can use this new knowledge. And that is an expectation that has been communicated formally because it is a requirement for my promotion. And informally, my colleagues say, you know what, everything else doesn't matter, this matters most, so focus on it. And that sort of helps me focus my work, that helps me focus my uh, uh, activities, but it's what I hear from my environment. It's all about communication. It is not what I see, uh, what I think it is. It is all about what I hear from people formally and informally. Social comparisons, again, where do I stand? And how do I realize where I stand? It depends upon what people say, how people talk, gossip, formal, informal, appraisals awards, all of that stuff. Identification with the organization or citizenship. Again, what does the organize, what kind of work has been assigned to me in the organization? Does the organization consider me to be a, an integral part? Are there uh, important meetings that I am called to or am I sidelined? Uh, you know, all those things will have a bearing on how involved I feel within organization, how uh, important a citizen I think of an uh, I think I am of an organization that I am a part of and that will in turn impact my uh, uh, level of involvement in that organization. Benefits of communication networks, again we have these formal and informal networks and uh, they can ultimately impact how uh, connected I feel to my organization and how involved I feel with my organization, how, how much I feel I can contribute to my organization. Okay. Communication and organizational involvement. Um, the first uh, issue here is the need for positive communication by juniors may feel burdensome to the senior members. We are slowly moving towards a society where we are insisting on positive reinforcement and um, hesitating to, sh to be very uh, or being very, very polite with negative reinforcement. 
and more and more people are craving uh, positive reinforcement uh, much more than they were earlier. So again, the discussion is quite long for this, I'm not going to get into it, but this need for positive communication by juniors or new entrants can feel burdensome to the senior members who feel that uh, positive contribution to the organization is an expectation and uh, negative contribution to the organization is something that needs to be talked about to bring people to status quo. Why should I waste my time telling people, reminding people of what they actually should be doing unless it affects the status quo. I would much rather spend that time and energy on making sure that things happen. So, and again, that that's a perfectly valid uh, standpoint. Lack of informal organizational communication negatively relates to job satisfaction of new members. Uh, again, um, informal organizational communication has its benefits. Uh, it puts us on an even footing with seniors, with our peers. It uh, gives us information. It gives us links to new information. When I don't have that, um, I can start feeling uncomfortable and I can start feeling that I'm uh, not really, you know, I can't be getting all this information, but this inf informal information that comes to me is very, very relevant. It, it helps me feel satisfied with my job. It helps me, especially the positive information coming, uh, helps, me, helps me feel that I'm uh, uh, doing a good job at whatever I'm doing. Low levels of communicative support from superiors may have a bearing on turnover. So uh, if people don't talk to their juniors, if people don't tell their juniors um, how well they're doing their work, uh, people may feel dissatisfied and that may prompt them to leave the organization. They'll say, I'm not treated like family here. Um, it's just work. And if it's just work, I would much rather go to a place that pays me higher and also gives me a better environment. Communication of information on a need to know basis can be uncomfortable for new employees and may lead to one or both of the above. Um, so and so doesn't need to know this. It doesn't concern his or her work. Um, most of us are likely to feel uncomfortable about such things. Let me decide what I need to know and what I don't need to know. But if it is information in an organization, in a public organization, the information should be publicized. Whatever information there is needs to be made public. So I can choose what I can use to make my work better. How can you decide what kind of information is going to make my work better? Uh, empowerment uh, needs to be communicated appropriately and adequately. I need to, you know, there needs to be some reinforcement uh, about uh, how uh, important a contributor I am to my organization. And uh, that needs to be done often enough and uh, it needs to be done uh, in a significant quantity for me to feel involved with my work. Negotiating roles. A role is a duty one is asked to perform uh, and the manner in which the individual performs uh, the duty. Uh, that is a role and role negotiation is a process in which newcomers compromise between their expectations and the expectations of the organization. I come to a uh, role, a, a piece of work that I feel is going to be very helpful for my career, big deal. Big deal. The organization may not feel that way. The organization hasn't hired me so that it can improve my career. The organization has hired me because I'm going to be uh, doing some service to the organization. I'll help them make money. I will help them achieve their goals. I'll help them reach their mission. Uh, I will help them achieve their vision. Um, I have to be used more useful to the organization from the organization standpoint I have to be more useful to the organization than it is to me it is compensating me for my work but I have to be useful to it and from my standpoint I join an organization because it benefits me my work to the organization is just my uh, uh, input so that I can get the output from the organization that I want. It gives me a good stamp on my resume. It gives me challenging experience. It gives me tons of money. So I have my goals. Now, when we come to role uh, negotiation, my role 
and the organization's expectation of my role have to be negotiated in and through talk. We have to talk amongst ourselves, we have to be sensitive to the signals coming from our environments and we have to reach a point where both of us feel satisfied. It's not going to be here. If my expectation from the organization is here and the organization's expectation from me is here, both of us are not going to be able to make it here. But what can happen is that the organization comes down a little bit and I, this is me, okay. So the organization comes down a little bit and I come down a little bit, I'm still closer to it. But we sort of, you know, go up and down till we both reach a level. Yes, you are, uh, I get a good stamp on my resume. I may have to do certain kinds of work that I don't enjoy very much. The organization says, okay, this person is adding value. Once in a while, I may need to give the person a longer leash. Let him or her make mistakes. Let him or her explore things that he or she needs, li really likes to do so that they stay in the organization because the contribution is very high. So that's how we negotiate our roles. And this happens through constant positive and negative feedback from the environment and our sensitivity to that feedback. And that's where communication comes in. Okay. Uh, again, um, it is the sudden spate of politically correct or euphemistic terms. You decide how you want to perceive the situations and labels and you take it from there. How do you negotiate your roles? Organization says you're a resource. And I say, no, I am a customer service executive. So I'm formal. Uh, I'm supposed to serve the customer and I'm supposed to make the customer happy. And uh, this fancy label is attached to me by the organization. So I start feeling happy. I relate more to that label than to the actual work I'm doing. And that in turn impacts the quality of my work. I feel that I'm doing a great job. That uh, I'm, I feel I'm doing an important job and that in turn relates to my work further and uh, sorry adds to my work uh, the positive uh, impact uh, it has a positive impact on the quality of work I produce okay factors affecting role negotiation newcomers role development and time pressure uh, how my role develops and uh, the amount of time it takes for that role to develop is uh, influenced by the directness of the feedback that I get, both positive and net negative. Elaboration of uh, uh, the feedback that I get, elaboration of the role by the organization, my elaboration, my details, my communication of those details to my superiors and some mutual concessions that we make. Uh, you know, I'm willing to step down a notch if you are willing to step down a notch and I need to know till what point am I willing to step down. Contextual issues, again, um, where we stand in relation to the organization depends on the context that we find ourselves in, uh, what that context expects of us, what we expect of that context and all that stuff. Cultural and intercultural issues, again, my role in an organization will be defined by the culture I'm in, uh, by the expectations of that culture, by the appropriateness of my behavior as uh, governed by that culture. Gender issues, what we expect from men versus what we expect from women. Uh, women are not traditionally in a country like India expected to be aggressive. So if I start shouting at people to get them to do things, it's not considered very nice. And and then I'm labeled as somebody who's not ladylike. And, uh, you know, yes, uh, I'm supposed to get the work done, but I'm supposed to use more ladylike uh, communication style to get the work done rather than openly, you know, shouting and abusing people. Nobody should be doing that. But then, I mean, that's a very crude example here. But we don't expect certain genders to to uh, take on certain roles. And if they do, then they are uh, eyed with suspicion and their involvement may be questioned. Um, disability, again, limits what we can and cannot do and can shouldn't but does impact how we are perceived, how our contribution to an organization is perceived um, and how we perceive our role in the organization. <coughs> Developing job competency. Uh, the communication process involved in training members to develop task competency, coordinate tasks with co-workers and serve customers along with the interaction that enables newcomers to hone their skills through information seeking and feedback are significant aspects of organizational integration. I need you to think about this. 
I'm always going to, you know, once, not always, but once in a while, I'll give you these paragraphs, these definitions that I feel are so profound that will help you understand why I'm talking about all these different issues in a class on communication. Members actively evaluate and discuss the rewardingness of other members to the group and this is influenced to a great, G DA, sorry, to a great deal by the job competency of each member. The impact I have, the kind of work I produce will be affected by, uh, will have an impact on how people talk about me and uh, how people evaluate me and that will in turn feed back into how competently I do my work. Some communicative factors affecting job competency, all the factors, all the stages that have been mentioned above. My relationship with my superiors, my communication with my co-workers, uh, how much information I seek from people, uh, my uh, involvement in the organization, uh, my uh, uh, influence within the organization, uh, you know, all, all of those factors are uh, important here. Communication apprehension. Uh, is another thing that is uh, uh, that can affect how competently I uh, do my job. Communication apprehension is my uh, my uh, intrapersonal barriers to communication. So how well I seek information is one thing, but do I feel comfortable communicating with my superiors? Do I feel comfortable? communicating with uh, my juniors, do I feel comfortable uh, seeking information, when do I draw the line, when do I hesitate, all of that will have an impact on how well I do my job. An ability to express what one knows about one's uh, job is another factor that affects job competency. Uh, emotion management, I would have liked to show you these clips but maybe I will hold off till next time, I guess I was just explaining too many things. Time is running out, but we will uh, see these clips in the next class when we revise um, all of this stuff. But the other aspects uh, that impact emotion management, emotion management just uh, for starters is the management, the coordination of our emotions, uh, how we express our emotions or where we withhold our emotions, where we share what we uh, feel like sharing in our professional settings. And there are intercultural implications. Again, we've discussed some of those in the class on intercultural communication. We'll be discussing some more in the class on conflict. There are implications for the perception of authority. Uh, you know, how my expression of my positive and negative emotions impacts how authoritative, how sound people think I am in my position of authority and how, how much people listen to me, how well people listen to me. Face negotiation is a concept that was uh, uh, talked about to a great deal by Stella Ting to me and uh, it is about uh, more about impression management. Um, uh, you know, it is about the negotiation of our public image and uh, that in turn depends on my expression of emotions in the workplace. Uh, persuasion and manipulation again depends to a great deal on how well I manage my emotions or where I uh, uh, share my emotions and how uh, leadership again has a uh, bearing on uh, the management of emotions and vice versa. Management of emotions impacts how well people perceive me or how good a leader people perceive me to be. Power and influence are uh, the other aspects of uh, acculturation, of uh, becoming a part of an organization, of the, the implications of organizational communication. We discussed the Pell's effect. Uh, we'll have more discussion when we discuss persuasive communication, groups and teams and uh, leadership. Now for some revision. We finished the lecture. Now, before your next class, I would like you to do the following. I would like you to list the differences between the different types of socialization techniques that we talked about and I want you to discuss the utility for the orientation of different levels of different employees in different types of organizations. In which kind of industry would you uh, uh, feel the need for uh, individual socialization? 
in which kind of industry would collective socialization be better which kind of industry would uh, different types of socializations apply what level would be most uh, what technique of socialization would be uh, which technique of socialization would be more applicable to which kind of industry or which kind of role and all of that stuff so i want you to to share the examples from your own backgrounds from your own uh, experiences and uh, discuss these things in class the other thing that i would like you to discuss here is the implications of intercultural differences on the following in an organization um, how is organizational assimilation or socialization affected by uh, uh, intercultural differences between people how is superior subordinate uh, communication affected by intercultural differences between people uh, emotion management uh, and intercultural communication are very 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 deeply related uh, how does the management of different emotions uh, connect with or impacts the socialization of new employees in an organization um, how does management of emotions impact supervisor subordinate communication uh, how does uh, how is power and control influenced by intercultural differences uh, what do we do in order to uh, to uh, exert power over people how do we persuade people all of these things they will all come up when we discuss persuasive communication when we discuss conflict management when we discuss the applications of these things in different settings uh, in our uh, lives as uh, uh, international um, uh, corporate man uh, executives as uh, sorry as business professionals in the international business environment as professionals technical and uh, i'm sorry as professionals in the international business environment how do these things impact our lives will be discussed in the lectures to follow and uh, uh, please watch the movie the queen and uh, think of how it relates to what we've been talking about uh, so we'll take this up in the next session thank you